But uh, so I think we can get started now. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And thank you, Francisco, for speaking today. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Francisco um, Mueller Sanchez. He uh, is our speaker today. Uh, Francisco received his PhD degree in uh, physics and astronomy from uh, uh, LMU in Munich, uh, working at the MPE uh, in Germany. And uh, he's currently an assistant professor at Memphis. And before that, he spent uh, three years as a postdoc fellow, a very prestigious postdoctoral position at the IAC in Spain. Um, and then he was uh, two years a postdoc at uh, UCLA. And uh, then he spent five years as a research associate at uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder. And as I said before, he is an assistant professor at University of Memphis. Uh, and Francisco has an amazing range of expertise. I was just looking. In fact, I think that you had an engineering degree initially. I think yes. I saw. <laughs> and so I just was amazed at looking at all the different things you've done and uh, how many you know, multi-wavelength observations you have obtained as PI and COI ranging, I think, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum um, and uh, using CAC, uh, using Gemini, uh, even using SOFIA, I saw you use <laughs> SOFIA, and space-based observations and radio observations, and I think ALMA <laughs> observations. So, uh, Francisco has really spanned a very impressive wide range of uh, multi-wavelength uh, observational expertise. And uh, he, uh, he studies really interesting problems on AGNs and feedback and mergers and dual AGNs. And uh, I've really enjoyed reading your papers and um, to learn about all of the new work, including your JWST proposal, which was so exciting and congratulations on that. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Francisco to everybody uh, for today's seminar, uh, where he's uh, going to be talking about a lot of his exciting results on AGN outflows and the impact of AGNs on their host galaxies. So I will turn it over to you, Francisco. Yes. Well, thank you, Shavita, for this nice introduction and for inviting me to give a talk at this uh, webinar series. Um, I'm very happy to be here. So let me just share my screen with you and start the uh, presentation. Uh, okay. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the aspects uh, that I think are um, very important for studies of uh, coevolution of black holes and galaxies. And that is exactly the impact that AGN outflows have in their host galaxies. So specifically, I'm going to show recent results from two international collaborations, which use uh, mostly adaptive optics assisted integral field spectroscopy uh, to characterize the environments around supermassive black holes. So one of these collaborations is the uh, Pona collaboration, the Keck Osiris nearby AGN survey, where we study um, a sample of 40 luminous uh, cipher galaxies um, with adaptive optics and integral field spectroscopy. And the other one is called uh, the multi-wavelength observations of dual AGN or MODA, uh, where we are using uh, this technique uh, to study um, the central regions of the, well, uh, at the moment it's 10, but this number is changing all the, all the time. So the 10 confirmed dual AGN at redshift less than 0.05. Um, so I'm going to present results from uh, these two projects, which in the end, um, I always say, well, in one uh, project, we are using this technique to study single AGN or AGN mostly in spiral galaxies or elliptical, and the other one it's in galaxy merges, but they are confirmed dual AGN 
but the redshift range that we are using is uh, similar, so redshift less than uh, 0.05. Uh, now we'd like to start with a brief introduction to the topic and then um, the next three, four slides and show results for both uh, projects. So I think it is now recognized that inflows and outflows are the drivers of evolution uh, within galaxies. Uh, but this was not the case uh, uh, approximately 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Uh, as you can see, there were groups who were doing uh, galaxy studies and other groups were doing black hole studies, but there was very uh, little overlap. Um, people who were doing galaxies, they were studying large scale structure of galaxies, maybe kinematic perturbations, um, uh, spirals, bars, et cetera. And they thought there was a, a little connection with the supermassive black hole at the center uh, because of the small uh, uh, spatial scales where the black hole resides. So the black hole lives in its ecosystem and the galaxy is so big. And something similar happened for black hole studies where they were trying to understand just what the black hole is doing maybe around its environment. But there was not this real connection uh, with the host uh, galaxy. But there were some studies specifically with uh, AGN uh, where people thought, well, these are so powerful that they uh, probably have some influence in the host galaxy. So there were some papers around this year, 1998, by um, Kenny Kut and others, uh, where they proposed this idea of uh, coevolution of supermassive black holes and galaxies. But mostly, uh, I would say in the 1999, when um, two papers, one from uh, Laura Ferrarese and the other one, uh, Gebhard et al, uh, 2000, um, they uh, actually uh, proposed or discovered <clears throat> the M sigma relation. So that's why around these years, uh, we learned that the black hole is connected somehow to its uh, host galaxy. And that's what happened um, in, or what is happening in recent years there is a lot of um, overlap when we want to understand what is happening um, in a galaxy. We always have to uh, understand as well, what is the black hole or the AGN uh, doing? What is the luminosity? Are there outflows, et cetera? And as it indicates here, um, the region where this um, interaction is considered, well, I mean, in these two studies, in these two groups, um, we attribute that to what we call AGN feedback. Um, so AGN feedback, uh, we can say it can be uh, understood as um, the um, energy or the amount of mechanical energy that is injected by the AGN to the interstellar medium. And this um, injection of energy is very helpful for many applications. Uh, uh, in theoretical models of galaxy evolution, they need this injection of energy to explain different galaxy properties. Um, so feedback is good for many things, as you can see in, in this slide. Uh, I would think the most important is shown in the left, where in the left panel, where we think that feedback slows down star formation in galaxies. And basically what it does is that, um, uh, it can reproduce uh, many of the um, uh, galaxy black hole relations that we see uh, nowadays, as you can see here, the M sigma relation. I think this one is from uh, Gultekin or, or McConnell, actually. Um, but yeah, uh, with this extra injection of energy, um, it is possible to slow down star formation in galaxies. It prevents galaxies from overgrowing and basically to reproduce uh, these relations. But feedback is uh, also useful for other things. So people recognize, okay, we can use this idea of uh, extra energy from the AGN that we call AGN feedback um, to, uh, for example, explain the formation of elliptical galaxies. So it, it uh, shuts down star formation in elliptical galaxies and also the cooling in clusters where we see that uh, the cooling that is predicted uh, by models, uh, basically the loss of the solar masses per year in the intra-cluster medium 
is occurring much slower. So this cooling is not uh, occurring as it was expected, uh, but it's heated somehow. And, and, and one of the theories is that it's heated by AGN. Uh, and the other um, application uh, would be similar in, in the case that um, the, inter, the intergalactic medium has more metals that, than we expected. And again, it is believed that AGN outflows or AGN feedback can transport gas metals out of galaxies and enrich uh, the intergalactic medium. So as you can see, there are um, many applications of uh, AGN feedback. And um, the interesting thing is that we are just starting to understand how uh, it actually works in, in galaxies, uh, or even if it works in, in some cases, um, we do not see any feedback. So that's what I'm going to discuss uh, here today, some highlights on recent results on this topic. And as I already mentioned, um, I am the PI of several observational campaigns of these uh, two collaborations the Kegosite is nearby AGN survey and, and the multivalent observations of dual AGN. And uh, the two first papers of these collaborations are uh, mentioned here. So it's Mueller Sanchez et al. 2018A, where we describe the CONA survey uh, and the characteristics of the sample, the 40 galaxies that we have observed with uh, Osiris at Keck, and um, the science goals of the collaboration. And the second paper, Mueller Sanchez et al. 2018b, is actually a study of uh, outflows in the prototypical merger slash dual AGN NGC 6240. And it is one of the first papers of the uh, MODA collaboration. So many things that I will mention here are actually um, mentioned in these uh, two papers, specifically the, the second one. Uh, uh, Miller Sanchez et al. 2018b, because in this talk I will uh, focus on the case study of NGC 6240. So I will talk about the results that we present uh, in that paper as an example of the um, things that we're observing in confirmed uh, dual AGN. So in the next 30 minutes, I think, and the first 15 minutes, I will talk about. Uh, uh, single AGN and the other 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, dual AGN, specifically NGC 6240. Okay, so I think we're all familiar with the concept of integral field spectroscopy. I just want to mention here that um, a couple of years ago, I, I was looking at um, statistics of papers in, in the field of uh, nearby AGN. Um, what is the most popular topic uh, using integral field spectroscopy? And it turns out that the, um, uh, most people have been using these instruments to study inflows and outflows in, in the field of nearby AGN, which is something that 30 years ago, I mean, when people started to build these instruments, um, I mean, people knew that there were many applications and people were going to do many things, but they thought maybe the most popular areas would be a star formation or measuring black hole masses. And surprisingly, and that has happened, of course, but not, uh, as I was saying, where more than 70% of the papers are related to inflows and outflows. And I think this is due to the fact, uh, well, I think there are two reasons. One of them is that this technique is ideal, of course, to map the kinematics of the centers of galaxies. So I think the power of interior field spectroscopy is that we can obtain um, kinematic maps, velocity and dispersion maps of gas and stars in the center of galaxies. And we do that um, using um, uh, several uh, interior field spectrographs use similar techniques. So very briefly, these instruments literally cut the field of view or, 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 or the image at the focal plane of the telescope. As you can see here, this is uh, divided in six regions or cut in six uh, small regions. And then through um, optics, um, mirrors and lenses, then we can um, arrange these small parts of the field of view um, and then create what we call that pseudo slit, which then we can uh, pass through a, a normal spectrograph. And then in the end, in the detector, we will have several small spectra uh, that we can uh, reconstruct in the computer 
in a final product that is the data cube. So in, in the end, in the data cube, we will have a spectrum uh, for each pixel in the field of view. And this demonstrates what I just mentioned, the power of interfield spectroscopy, that then we can construct kinematic maps of different emission and absorption lines. And the other reason is just what I just mentioned in the introduction. Uh, I think in, in the field of galaxy evolution, um, uh, like I said a minute ago, people recognize now inflows and outflows are the drivers of evolution uh, within galaxies. So I think those two reasons um, explain why interior field spectroscopy has been widely used for studies of AGN feeding and feedback or <clears throat> inflows and outflows. Okay, so this is an example of an integrated spectrum of the galaxy NGC 4388, where I just want to show um, for both the Kona and the, and the MODA collaboration, um, the type of emission lines that we are studying. We are obtaining similar spectra for all the galaxies in our samples. Um, and I wanted to show this because this shows a lot of emission lines. Of course, some of the galaxies that are not that nice <laughs> or do not have all these emission lines. And there is much more noise in the spectrum, et cetera. But here um, you can see several transitions of uh, molecular hydrogen. So this is a spectrum in the K-band from 1.96 approximately to 2.35 microns. And um, in this part of electromagnetic spectrum, we have a, a lot of rotational and vibrational transitions of molecular hydrogen. And we have uh, ionized hydrogen, so one recombination line of hydrogen, which is bracket gamma. And we have several ionization lines like in this case, we see silicon six, aluminum nine, uh, and calcium eight. So um, these are different species of gas, right? So that's, uh, in my opinion, the advantage of this uh, spectrum, the K-band spectrum, that we can study what the molecular gas is doing with molecular hydrogen. We can study what the low ionization gas is doing, basically ionized hydrogen with bracket gamma. And we can study what the highly ionized gas is doing with um, silicon six or calcium eight or aluminum nine. Now, as I mentioned, not all the galaxies have uh, uh, all these emission lines, particularly talking about high ionization lines. We do not see calcium eight or aluminum nine in, in many other galaxies, but silicon six is always present. Um, among the, the luminous cipher and, and dual AGN that we have observed. Um, so that's why I, I, have, uh, um, I have drawn these arrows, the red arrows at the bottom where I indicate the lines that we are studying in detail um, in, in the spectra of all these galaxies. So we are always looking for molecular hydrogen at 2.12 microns bracket gamma 2.16, 2.17 microns, and silicon six at 1.97 um, <clears throat> microns. So most of the results that I will show here are based on these emission lines. Okay, so in this slide, I just mentioned the, the coma science goals. As you can imagine, we can do many things. We can study up inflows and answer the question, what drives gas from 100 parsec scales into the nucleus? outflows, which is the topic of this talk, how the accreting black holes influence their host galaxies. We can also study um, the components of the unification model of AGN, specifically at these scales. We can study some properties of the molecular torus uh, or, or also the narrow line region and their connection to unification schemes. And with a sample of 40 uh, cipher galaxies, observed with the same technique, with the same spatial resolution, um, and with integral field spectroscopy, then we can study trends in nuclear properties with AGN uh, properties and Cipher type. Um, and again, as you know, this talk is about outflows, but I just want to mention all the other things. And these are just a few things uh, that we can do. Uh, like I said at the beginning, actually, we could also do star formation studies or measuring black hole masses, and, and that is something that I don't even mention here, right? So there are many things that, that we can uh, do with these type of data sets. Okay, so um, these are some results uh, for the Galaxy NGC 3081. So 
I'm going to show only a few examples here. Um, of course, I, I do not have time to show all the evidence that we have for aging outflows and, and their impact. Uh, so I'm going to uh, describe one or two cases um, that we have been studying uh, for this collaboration. So here, um, there are many things that I would like to uh, mention. Um, first is the power of uh, near infrared uh, observations, where you can see here that, um, well, first, using adaptive optics, of course, we obtain very good spatial resolution. We can reach almost the diffraction limit of them uh, of an eight meter class telescope. So we can compare what is in the top panel, the seeing limited O3 image, this would be from the ground, the O3 image of the nuclear region of this galaxy, of course, uh, the resolution uh, probably is like 0.8 are seconds or, or maybe worse, I, I, I'm not sure, but you see that there is no morphology, no structure in this O3 image. Now with HST, so in the middle panel in the um, uh, top row, um, it's again uh, O3 in 400 seconds, where you can see that uh, there is like a, um, enhanced emission in the north part of the galaxy, of course, at, at the position of the AGN indicated here uh, with a black cross. Uh, but we do not see anything um, in the south uh, part of the galaxy. I mean, we do not see O3 emission, or at least it's very uh, faint. Um, but uh, this is actually a, a symphony image of this galaxy, which is the same as the Osiris image or very similar. Um, where, where we are working in the K band, we can obtain the morphology and the kinematics of silicon six. And you can see that uh, in this particular case, um, we can detect actually as a symmetric structure. So we see emission in the north part of the galaxy and in the south part of the galaxy that probably it's, there is some indication in the HST image, but the full structure and the full morphology does not appear there. And that could be because maybe 400 seconds was not enough for this galaxy, or uh, maybe the, the, the most um, uh, logical explanation maybe is that this is uh, obscured by the galaxy. So in the optical, we are uh, suffering more from extinction Whereas in the near infrared, in the K band, uh, we are not affected that much by extinction. Then we can see the true morphology of this structure in highly ionized gas, silicon six, which may be similar to O3, but yeah. Uh, we, we do not know if there is something in the south here uh, or not. And then in addition, we have now in the, in the um, uh, bottom row, in the three panels there, A, B, C, we have the kinematics, right? So this is, um, in this slide, I, I try to uh, demonstrate with this example, what we see in many of uh, our galaxies and where the evidence for outflow is coming from. And that is when, I, sorry, when we compare uh, panels A and B. So this is the velocity map of molecular hydrogen and the velocity map of silicon six in the middle panel or panel B. And um, it could be, A could be the, the, the velocity map of molecular gas or the stars, right? The important thing is that we have to identify the rotational pattern of the uh, gas in the central region, what the stars are doing, what is the molecular gas doing, and then we identify the rotational pattern. So we know, um, the position angle, the kinematic major axis, the kinematic minor axis, um, the inclination, etc., and that is what we know that the, what the gas should be doing if it is rotating, right? And you can see in panel B, like I said, this is one example of many. Silicon six is uh, always uh, doing something else, something completely different to what you would expect from um, pure rotation, and it is usually something like you see in these uh, velocity maps where you see that the kinematic major axis is actually perpendicular or almost perpendicular to the kinematic major axis of the rotating disk in this galaxy. Um, so this is almost zero degrees and this is 90 degrees in H2. And um, it is usually not coplanar, which means 
that is uh, not in the plane of the galaxy. So this evidence combined with the fact that in some cases we see very high velocities, uh, velocities larger than um, 300 kilos per second in Silicon 6, or very width, uh, the width of the emission line is larger than 400 or 500 kilos per second, or there is a blue wing in the spectra. Um, so all these things combined then um, allows us to interpret the kinematics of Silicon 6 in all cases as outflows. So the, if there is something I want to remember for this talk is, is that the kinematics of Silicon 6 are always dominated by outflows. So if we detect, uh, and this is also seen in other studies, right? It's not only the studies from our group, from our collaboration, um, other groups using Gemini or Symphony, um, they have found the same thing. So the corona lines, specifically Silicon 6, which is in the near infrared, you will always see uh, what the outflowing gas is doing. And that is very helpful um, because then we can use uh, the kinematics of the stars, what we know there will be rotating, and the kinematics of Silicon 6 that we know there will be in an outflow. And then we can use that to interpret other complex kinematics, which are usually those of molecular hydrogen or uh, bracket gamma, where you see several kinematic components and sometimes it is very difficult to interpret the nature of those kinematic components. So doing this analysis, um, sometimes uh, it is helpful to rule out some possibilities. Like actually in, in this example, again, you can see that H2, uh, I mean, it's dominated by rotation, but there is something else there. There is another kinematic component because the uh, kinematic minor axis or the zero velocity line, which would be the the green color in H2 is not uh, a straight line. So you see there is some perturbation that in this fact, it looks like an S shape. If you follow um, the green line here, and that is uh, a characteristic of um, an M2 perturbation, basically uh, a bar. So in this galaxy, um, which is this paper that we're working on right now here in my group. One of my students is actually um, studying the inflow in this galaxy through uh, a molecular bar and the outflow that we see in Silicon 6. Now, once we have identified um, the outflow, then we use uh, a few arguments uh, to actually conclude that these are AG and outflow. So this is something we discussed, I remember last week as well, a little bit. So I want to tell you what we do here for Kona and, and Moda. Uh, well, for Kona is, is actually easier because these are not mergers. With mergers it's a little bit more difficult, but just very briefly. Um, the first thing of course, is that these galaxies, um, they are not uh, actively forming stars. So these, these are not really uh, uh, star forming galaxies. So the star formation rates, in the majority of these galaxies is around one solar mass per year. So just that starting point is telling us that there is not so much star formation going on in these galaxies to produce uh, powerful outflows. So that's uh, the starting point. And the other one is what I just mentioned that we see mostly these outflows in silicon six, sometimes bracket gamma, but bracket gamma as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, sometimes it's complex to interpret because it has components from rotation, outflow, maybe inflow. Um, so it's not a clean, so clean, let's say, <laughs> tracer of outflows. The same with molecular hydrogen sometimes. So um, although we see outflows in bracket gamma, of course, it is not that easy to uh, identify them as in silicon six. So anyway, um, because the, the outflows are in highly ionized gas that can only be produced by a very hard continuum source like the AGN. Um, that already also indicates that probably these are AGN driven outflows, right? I mean, it would be very difficult to imagine that we have the AGN ionizing the gas to, to these levels like silicon six in that region. And in that region, we also see, like you can see the morphology of silicon six here and the kinematics, we see the outflow expanding and, and moving in that direction. Um, and that is driven by the stars. So uh, already we have some uh, a priori knowledge or something that would tell us, well, these are probably agent outflows just by considering two facts. 
they are outflows in highly ionized gas, and there is very little star formation in the host galaxies. Although some of them have more, but like I said, the average star forming rate like one solar masses per year. But then we also have um, the kinematics, right? And one thing that uh, um, uh, I think is very important to distinguish aging outflows and star, uh, starburst driven outflows is the kinematic power of the outflow. So that is something that I will mention in a few minutes, but uh, now that I'm uh, saying that uh, we are detecting aging outflows, I want to mention this very quickly. Usually the kinematic the, or the kinetic power of these outflows is uh, much higher than what we would expect just from star formation alone. So based on the star formation rate of the galaxy, we can calculate what would be the kinetic power of the alpha if it was just driven by star formation. And that usually is two or three orders of magnitude less than the kinetic powers that we are measuring, um, which are more comparable to the volumetric luminosity of the AGN in all these galaxies. So I think that's um, a very strong argument in favor of the AGN nature of these outflows. And the other one is the time scale, which is a similar argument where we can calculate um, the time scale of the outflow based on the size, the morphology, and, and the velocity of the outflow. And again, it turns out that the stellar populations in these galaxies, which are um, larger than um, 10 mega years, more around 100 mega years, uh, is not consistent with the time scale of the outflow, which is on the order of one mega year or a few mega years, which is more consistent with, the, with an AGN cycle. Um, so I think those two arguments are very strong in favor of the AGN nature of these outflows. Okay, so finally, <laughs> I want to uh, mention that we have developed some uh, 3D models of biconical outflows that we can um, uh, rotate in space and we can play with the parameters. Uh, you can see that in panel D here. Uh, where each pixel in this structure, in this model, is, is a um, velocity in the line of sight. So we have uh, blue sheeted material uh, that is coming towards us, uh, as indicated by the arrow. We are looking that direction, and the red sheeted material is behind. So we are applying these models to all the galaxies in our sample. And finally, panel E shows the geometric model for this galaxy specifically where we show the orientation of the outflow and the orientation of the disk in this particular galaxy. Okay, so this is another example where I'm showing one extreme case uh, because the velocities that we see here, we do not see them in other nearby AGN. So this is the galaxy NGC 1068, and this is what the gas is doing at different uh, velocities. So this is like, um, uh, um, it's called velocity tomography of the emission line. Again, this is silicon six. And you can see that we see silicon six uh, down to minus 1,400 kilometers per second in the northeast. And then you can see how um, uh, the gas is changing with velocity up to plus 600 kilometers per second in the um, southwest. So this is the northeast, this is the southwest and the range of velocity. This is line of sight velocity. It's not even the width of the line. So we see the line at uh, silicon six at minus 1,400 kilos per second. And this is the record holder, I think, in the nearby universe. Uh, maybe high redshift outflows, they have velocities of 1,000 kilos per second as well or similar, but um, I, I don't remember something similar in the nearby uh, universe. So. This is an, another example of how we are detecting after just looking at the um, velocities. And if we see something like this, that I already said, this is also uh, extra planar, so it's not in the plane of the galaxy, then we are sure that these are outflows. So this is just another example. Now we have obtained, as I said, some measurements like mass outflow rates and kinetic power of the outflows. Um, I'm not going to discuss all these numbers in details. This was our initial work with a few galaxies. Here you can see six or seven galaxies. I think in this plot, there are more in the plot that I'm showing uh, in this slide. Um, but now we have more uh, numbers, uh, at, at least for uh, 10 more galaxies here. So this is an ongoing 
uh, work, of course, but I want uh, to describe this ratio, which is the kinetic power to volumetric luminosity ratio, where you can see that some of these galaxies have a relatively high ratio, like 0.05, that would be 5% uh, of the volumetric luminosity corresponds to the kinetic power of the outflows. This is almost 3%. Uh, um, it would be 0.04, et cetera. You can see the, the number. Um, so we have obtained this plot where we are uh, plotting the X axis, the size of the radio jet, and in the Y axis, the, the ratio of kinetic power to volumetric luminosity. And although there is no real correlation here, we can see that there are two groups. So some galaxies with uh, high kinetic power, uh, they also have relatively extended radio jets. I mean, larger than 100 parsecs, 200 parsecs radio jets. And those that do not have a strong um, ratio of kinetic power to volumetric luminosity, they also do not have extended um, radio jets. Now, probably this doesn't mean that these are radio jet uh, driven outflows because there is no real correlation. And in some cases, even the radio jet is not specially coincident with the location of the outflow, but it is telling us that uh, these AGN probably the ones that are um, here in, in the right, in the upper panel, uh, they are more powerful and they can produce uh, uh, outflows that are uh, more energetic than those that already do not produce large radio jets. But I think it is important to notice actually the horizontal line here, which corresponds to 0.5% uh, of volumetric luminosity of the AGN. And that is the number that uh, feedback models, this number changes. So of course, some people consider 1% or 5% as the, as the number that uh, indicates that feedback would have an impact on the evolution of the galaxy, or in other words, the energy imparted, the mechanical energy imparted by the outflow would be able to couple with the interstellar medium and basically create turbulence that prevents star, stars from forming. So basically slows down star formation. That's what this number indicates, the 0.5% of volumetric luminosity. So, here I have four galaxies. Uh, as I said, we have others that actually have a higher number than the 0.5% necessary from feedback models. So this shows that in nearby AGN, which are usually considered moderate luminosity or even in some cases low luminosity like NGC 3081, um, we have a, a ratio of kinetic power to volumetric luminosity that is higher than what the models predict for feedback to be effective in the galaxy. So I think this is one of the interesting results of our study that um, at least just considering this number, uh, feedback uh, seems to be efficient in this moderate luminosity AGN, but, I mean, in some of them, right? We have to uh, look at all the sample to actually conclude what, what are the results for the 40 galaxies that we have observed. Okay, and now in the next two, three slides, I will show um, what are we finding uh, related to the interaction of the outflows with the interstellar medium? Um, so basically, we have three cases. So in this slide, I'm showing the case of no significant interaction, where um, the maps that you can see here are actually in the left panel is the morphology of molecular hydrogen. In the middle panel is the velocity map of H2 and the right panel is the um, velocity map of silicon-6. So just looking at these maps and then the geometric model that we have obtained, of course, this is based on our models and our results, we see that the outflow is actually um, originating at, in the very central, in the central parsecs, I mean, at our scales, at our resolution, um, and then it propagates uh, in a direction where it's not intersecting the disk. Uh, of course, the, the disk has some thickness and probably there is some interaction there, but then most of the outflow is uh, outside the disk and that is happening in these two galaxies. So probably in these cases, even if the outflow is powerful, um, feedback, we will not see the effects of feedback so much in the host galaxy. Now in other cases, case number two, um, which would be in these uh, images, you can see NGC 1068 and NGC 4151. Um, we see cavities of molecular gas 
and then in those uh, small um, areas where there is no gas or, or we see very little gas in NGC 48, 4151 actually, uh, these wide spots, they, they just show that basically there is no molecular gas there. I mean, um, there was no emission line detected, but you can see that it looks like two shells around the center in NGC 4151. So we interpret this as cavities that um, the, the ionized gas is located inside the cavity in these two galaxies, by the way, that's what we can see in the geometric model. And that is pushing the gas away from the central region, um, basically removing gas and therefore uh, slowing down star formation in the central region of these galaxies. And the other case is uh, molecular gas entrained in the outflow. So basically outflows of molecular gas. So here I'm showing two examples where we see this case. Um, of course, uh, these are complex velocity fields, as I mentioned for H2, as the case of NGC 5643. Um, we have uh, this model and then on the residuals, we already have many things. So I'm, I just want to mention here that uh, we have identified uh, in the residuals the, the direction of the outflow, which is indicated in the dispersion uh, with this uh, conical structure, these two lines that I'm uh, indicating right now, but there are also inflows there. So and this is a more complicated case, uh, but this is H2. So the outflow is not only seen in silicon six or bracket gamma, but also in molecular gas. So a molecular outflow again um, indicates that the gas that is supposed to be forming stars is not doing that, but instead is a turbulent medium and it's uh, flying away. So again, it's evidence for uh, the slowing down star formation or, or suppression of star formation in these two galaxies. All right, so um, that was the first part of my talk. I think um, I have already explained many of the techniques and things we are using, so that's good. So I'm not going to um, explain in detail all the things that we observe for uh, NGC 6240 which is part of the MODA collaboration. Um, so uh, I'm not going to spend so much time describing the results for NGC 6240 because many of the things I, I have already described them, uh, they, they are the same techniques, so uh, that's good. So these are some of the MODA science goals. Of course, in this case, um, we are very much interested in learning how are supermassive black holes fueled in galaxy mergers and what are the inflow rates? So because these are confirmed dual AGM, we know that they are actively accreting uh, in their host galaxies in the merger. So uh, they must be there must be a mechanism that is fueling the two black holes. So that's one of the main science goals of this collaboration. Um, and the second one, which is what is the relative contribution from star formation, the two AGNs to the production of galactic winds, and what are the outflow rates? And finally are dual AGN consistent with the standard unification model of AGN. So by definition, I mean, we say dual AGN, they are AGN. So we would expect that they should follow the, um, the premises of the unification model of it, or maybe not, <laughs> but that's exactly what we would like to investigate uh, with these data sets uh, where we're incorporating adaptive optics, interior field spectroscopy, but also other um, multi-wavelength observations uh, because these are, more complex objects, right? <laughs> so that's why I just want to show one uh, case study, which is uh, NGC 6240, which is probably the, the, um, the most famous dual AGN in the universe, um, where we have discovered actually um, the effects or, 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 yeah, we have discovered for the first time two different outflows acting simultaneously in the galaxy. So one outflow driven by the AGN and the other one by star formation. And that's what I'm going to show you uh, today here. So this is just some background about the galaxy, um, the star formation rate that has been measured uh, around 100 solar masses per year. So there is a lot of star formation going on here and in the other dual AGN as well. So this complicates the case as, as I was describing the Cipher galaxies before. Uh, the separation between the two nuclei is 700 parsecs approximately. And you can see that the southwestern nucleus is more powerful than the northeastern nucleus by a factor of three 
uh, approximately. So these are just some, num some numbers that I wanted to uh, show and, and that you have an idea of the context of these um, observations. And what I'm showing here are the famous observations by Comosa et al. 2003 in the X-rays, where they confirm the dual AGN nature of this galaxy. And in the right panel, this is another confirmation now using BLBI by Gallimore et al. Uh, 2004, or uh, well, radio, I'm not sure this is BLBI or BLA actually, um, but it's in the radio, you can see the two radio sources. Um, okay, so, Basically, in our work, what we did is that we dissected the butterfly in NGC 6240. So this is structure that I call the butterfly is just um, ionized gas that has been observed in H alpha that has the shape uh, or opportunity the shape of a butterfly. So using Hubble images, integral field spectroscopy, um, also long lead spectroscopy, um, we were able to uh, study different regions of the butterfly. So basically we divided uh, the central region of the galaxy in four regions that you can see the, on the small image here, region one, region two, region three, region four. And that was done based on um, this image that you see here, which is a three-color composite image of uh, H alpha in red, uh, the continuum emission um, around 500 nanometers in green, and the O3 emission in blue. So um, I will just briefly describe uh, our results here and then I can answer your questions later so that I don't use much more time. But we see that most of the H alpha is located in this region that we call the H alpha bubble or, or there is a, a lot of emission there. And then that would be region two. And region one is the opposite. There is very little H alpha there, but we see most of the O3 in that region that would be region one. And then regions uh, three and four, we see both. We see uh, H alpha emission and O3 emission and the same in region four, but there is this filament that you can see in the red color here that we call the, the H alpha filament. So those are the four regions that we have identified in the butterfly, of course, the, the um, newly formed galaxy or the, or the galaxy that is uh, appearing after the merger is in the in this um, connecting the two nuclei and that's what we see most of the dust. So we are um, interpreting that as the disk of the galaxy, although it's not the disk of the galaxy as we know it because this is not a spiral galaxy or, or a galaxy. It's still a, a, an ongoing merger, but we have already, uh, uh, um, the merger has already established the direction of rotation of the gas that probably will be the, the newly formed galaxy in the future. Um, and that would be connecting the two AGN here. So those are the important regions that we have identified here. And now using all these techniques that I mentioned, here I'm just showing what I just mentioned about O3. You can see that most of the O3 emission is located in what would be the northeast part of the galaxy, what we call the O3 cone. Uh, although there is some O3 in other regions, probably also formed by stars, but it's mostly located here and is extra planar. I mean, this is completely out of the plane of the newly formed galaxy, where you can see here the molecular gas in the color scale and O3 in blue. And uh, there is no molecular gas where the O3 cone is located at all. So this is not part of the merger. This is not gas that was part of the merger event and is completely extraplanar, uh, is not located between the two um, AGN or in the region of the disk that I mentioned. Uh, some BPT diagrams to just show that in the region of the cone, which would be the, the PA of 56 degrees, we see some um, uh, cipher ratios, which is something that uh, was, I mean, in 2018, um, was not observed before in this galaxy, where most of the line ratios indicated, even at the location of the nuclei, um, liner or H2 uh, regions. Maybe some cipher in some studies, but uh, we detect several points along our long sleep. This was actually an instrument that, uh, at the Apache Point Observatory. Um, some points in the ionization cone or the O3 cone that correspond to cipher uh, ionization. 
and these are the velocity maps. So um, the important thing that uh, I want to emphasize here is that um, we are studying the ionized gas. So you can see the velocity map of bracket gamma is doing something completely different to uh, the stars and the molecular gas. So like I said, these are more complex uh, objects than the silver galaxies, but still the arguments or some of the arguments we use or the techniques can be used for these objects. And one of them is that, so you can see that in the northern nucleus, most of the emission in bracket gamma is red shifted. Um, and there is this alpha H alpha bubble, which corresponds also to bracket gamma bubble that I will uh, show in the next slide. And that is all red shifted and, and the velocities and the morphology of these maps is completely different to the stars where in, this, uh, in the northern nucleus, there is some rotation in the nucleus. The molecular gas is actually moving between the two nuclei in the central region of the merger, but this is completely different, just moving away from us in the H alpha bubble. Now, if we uh, do this exercise where we overplot the velocity map with the H alpha bubble, these are the velocity maps that you have seen, then we can see that um, this structure, these velocities corresponds to the uh, base of the bubble. And here you can see the velocity scale as well. And in the case of the uh, bracket gamma kinematics, we see velocities of 400 kilometers per second, approximately line of sight velocities. And that is too high to be explained either by the rotation in the nuclei or by the gas that is rotating or moving between the two nuclei, which is panel B here, so panels A and B. So this is a strong evidence for an outflow. Now we observe a similar thing in O3. Um, here the important thing to notice is the, the dispersion of the gas, again, at a PA of 56 degrees. These blue points indicate that the width of the line, you can also see here even in the spectrum, um, this is uh, a very wide emission line with velocities up to 1,200 kilometers per second. So again, this uh, corresponds to an outflow, but in this case, it's an outflow of O3. So we have an outflow of H alpha and another one of O3, and then doing the exercises and, and using the arguments that I mentioned for Cipher galaxies, we can conclude that the O3 cone is actually an AGN driven outflow and the H alpha bubble is actually an starburst driven outflow. And those are the numbers that you can see here when we compare the mass outflow rates, the dynamical time scale of the outflow and the kinetic power of the outflow. So you can see that the um, O3 cone is um, uh, approximately 20 times more powerful than the outflow observed in the H alpha bubble. Um, so uh, these are the, the results of this study. And this is something that we are um, also studying in other galaxies, as you can see, uh, we need to incorporate different data sets, multi volume observations, and, and different analysis to really understand what is happening in these galaxy mergers. But I think it's a very exciting field. And I will stop here now with uh, my conclusions. So I will leave this slide um, here uh, for you during the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. So um, that was fascinating and your, your data is amazing. So uh, we can take questions now. Mm -hmm. There is a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So Jim, yeah. do you want to ask, or, or or Francisco, you can. Yes, I I think I will read the question from Jim. Okay. Yeah, I think oh, you yes. answered it on the very last slide. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So actually, um, uh, I, in my introduction, I I mentioned that uh, aging outflows can uh, suppress or turn off star formation, but it's true. I I didn't actually cover the, the other part of AGN feedback where uh, in principle, this mechanical energy injected by the outflows, they can suppress star formation, but in some cases they could also enhance star formation in some uh, conditions. That's what we call positive feedback. 
so uh, actually the, the the discussion right now i think in in the field is um uh, what is the um, um, effect of positive feedback versus ne negative feedback versus no feedback at all <laughs> so yeah we have seen or there are studies that that show those three cases Great. Any other questions? Well, I think you said, though, on your second of the last slide, and sorry, I had typed the question before I saw that, but mm -hmm. I think on your second of the last slide, I think you're clearly seen, saying that the negative feedback supersedes. In other words, that's turning off star formation is much greater than the turning on. Mm -hmm. True, or did yes. I read that wrong? Yes. Thank you. Brian? Uh, hi, Francisco, very nice talk. Uh, very, very interesting work. Um, I, I was wondering, this: the Silicon 6 outflows, um, are, are those co-spatial with the um, dusty polar mid-infrared outflows that have been observed in uh, like Daniel Asmus's work or um, uh, are in sort of the new dusty polar outflow schematic that Sebastian Hunig's group has come up with over the last couple of years? Yes. Yeah. So the, the answer is yeah. Well, I've seen, I'm not familiar with all the work, but I've seen some of them, uh, at least one or two examples where we have observed the same galaxies and, and they are especially coincident. Yes. Oh, really interesting. Thank you so much. Yes. Hey, Brian, any other questions? Thomas. Hi, Francisco. Uh, Hi. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. So my question is uh, regarded to outflows and corona lines. Um, do you find any correlations between outflows and corona lines? For example, uh, kinematics or uh, if you see outflows, is there a higher chance of corona line detection or uh, stronger outflow means uh, stronger corona line emission. Do you see any correlations uh, in there? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. This is a good question, and it's something that we are uh, investigating right now. Um, so uh, yeah, I can answer one or two things uh, uh, of that because already we are studying them, finding correlations, etc. But one thing that uh, we have found is that. Um, all the galaxies that have corona lines, they have outflows. That that's the that, that we have what we have found, but also other groups have found similar results with smaller samples. Um, but the opposite is not uh, true, unfortunately. In some AGN that maybe there is, uh, I mean, they are X-ray AGN or radio AGN. Um, some of them they have outflows of maybe bracket gamma or O3 but they do not have um, uh, corona lines. Um, so that is something that actually is not part of our galaxies because all our galaxies, at least the ones that I described in this talk today are part of the Kona survey. So all of them, or uh, I think only one or two, we did not detect silicon six, but in the other 38, we detected silicon six. So in all those galaxies, we detected outflows. Hmm. All right, thank you. Interesting. Vivian? Oh, yeah. Thanks for a really great talk, Francisco. Um, I Hi, have Vivian. two Thank questions. You. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have two questions. So my first one actually is, uh, is a follow-up on uh, Jim's question of, uh, that, that, um, that was asked uh, about the positive feedback. So I think when we were looking at mergers, we actually see a uh, kind of enhanced star formation rate in the, the uh, candidates where we've identified AGN outflows. And I thought, but then it's maybe the, the connection is not very clear cut because, you know, obviously there's confounding factors with, you know, uh, the, the mergers that are more advanced stages and more ULERCs and they're just simply uh, forming more stars. So I'm wondering, you know, when, when we try to evaluate whether, you know, AGN feed, uh, positive or negative feedback that, that supersedes, is it are, are we talking about really sp similar spatial scales? Because a lot of times I get the impression that, you know, it's the maybe the AGN feedback at small scales, maybe they're 
potentially creating more stars because they're compressing the molecular gas, they're, they're doing something to the, to the gas, but then maybe on the whole, if it's power energetic enough, it's actually re removing gas on like maybe a larger scale. Do you see anything kind of like a spatial um, or anything that indicates some sort of spatial coincidence with, with the, this sort of um, thinking? Yeah, thank you, Vivian. So um, what you mentioned, we do not observe that in the Cipher galaxies. Mm -hmm. It seems that, um, well, I mean, those are completely different objects to the margins, right? Yeah. So the, um, the, the effect of the outflows is mostly uh, negative feedback. So removing okay. gas, like I said, the cavities or molecular outflows or increasing the velocity dispersion of the molecular gas and creating a turbulent medium, um, mostly negative feedback or no feedback at all. Like I mentioned, one or two cases. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we see there. But in mergers, um, I agree with, with your um, hypothesis or your suggestion that um, we have seen regions where um, there seems to be enhanced star formation where the outflows uh, are passing by, but then the overall effect of the outflow can be interpreted as, as removing gas. So uh, in galaxy mergers, like I said, I think the situation is more complex, but yes, we, we have seen actually that positive and negative feedback occurring in the same object uh, at, the, at the same time, but it's occurring in different regions of the merger event. Okay, um, thanks. And I have a sec second question, if it's okay. Um, so uh, about your Seifert um, outflows, uh, so I think it was NGC 3081 that you were showing, uh, mm -hmm. the outflow morphologies, I mean, the, they don't seem very collimated, right? Like, uh, is that typical of all the outflows that you see in a Seifert? So I would have expected, you know, naively that they would look um, more collimated or more with some kind of cone, sharper cones. Um, but I actually didn't see that in, in some of your data. So I was kind of curious about that. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's an interesting question uh, as well. So we are obtaining statistics for all these galaxies that we have studied. And um, right now with, with the objects that we have modeled and we have studied, I would say that the average opening angle, so the full opening angle of these uh, flows is around 90 degrees to 100 degrees. Um, so they are not very collimated, but they are not also like wide outflows, almost spherical outflows. Um, but this case of 3081, yeah, I say that um, it looks to me, I, I don't remember the, the, the opening angle right now, uh, but I think it's between 80 to 90 degrees, uh, the, the full opening angle. And, and I think that's uh, another argument that has been used uh, in the past, uh, also I mentioned that sometimes, um, that it seems that um, uh, aging outflows, they are usually more collimated than starburst-driven outflows. So outflows that we see in starburst galaxies like NGC 253 and 82 or, or Euler's, mm -hmm. uh, when they are starburst-driven, they, they are really uh, wide uh, outflows. I mean, the opening outflows are um, in some cases almost 180 degrees. <laughs> Um, but when they are AGN-driven outflows, they have opening angles that, uh, in, on average, like the number I mentioned, around 90 degrees. So they are more collimated. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, actually, I also had a question on that same slide. That's perfect. <laughs> um, so it's also similar to what Vivian was already asking about. So I was thinking about not just the opening angle, but basically the base of the cone. Because if we mm -hmm. imagine, depending on the, the actual physical size of that cone, is it really coming from a point or are we zooming in enough eventually that there's some kind of structure at the, at the base? So where the point would be for the bicone. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if there's a chance of having um, already like some kind of phenomena there. So of course this is a simplified model, right? With the perfectly symmetrical or symmetrical or asymmetrical, but the spike on versus having maybe like an hourglass shape or something where it doesn't come to a point. So I was wondering if this is something that could be modeled or not. And if that would, um, if, if, if we have enough high resolution data to constrain this, I don't know if you have an opinion on this. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I remember this from your talk as well, and um, I think there are two parts uh, to, to the answer. So, one of them is that at this special scale with the 
spatial resolution that we can get with these instruments. Um, in the majority of the cipher galaxies that we have studied, the base of the outflow, it's like a sharp point. Uh, but again, this is also depending on the resolution, right? But um, that's what we see in this outflow. And, and actually you can see it here more or less in the Silicon 6, the velocity map. Uh, we can start our model assuming that there is a sharp point, I mean, a very small region where the outflow is originating. Uh, and that's similar for other galaxies. And the second part is related to the models that we are using, which um, they all assume a structure like you can see here in panel D with a sharp point uh, intersecting the two cones. Um, something that I have been trying to uh, modify the most to actually do a truncated cone, something yeah. that you're describing where the base, yeah, is a, a, an extended area. Um, but until now, I, I haven't really seen um, a case, at least in these different galaxies, where I really need uh, to do that. Because in the end, that's like I mentioned at the beginning of the answer, it's just a very small region in our uh, field of view. So the uh, most of the uh, kinematics, the, the, the data points that, that we want to model and that we want to reproduce with the model, uh, in the end, we can um, just either run this uh, model with the sharp point uh, without doing the truncated cone, and, and probably we can reproduce the data. So I think this is something we can do even if we don't have the truncated cone model. OK. And my other thing was also related to um, when you look at the inner region and you sometimes find a cavity or a lack of molecular gas. Um, I wonder how easily it is to distinguish between uh, a hollow region from a bubble that blew out the gas versus um, sometimes, you know, you can find a ring that's a pileup of material, like a inner Lindblad resonance, there's a bar, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you have a ring of gas from a, uh, a resonance with a bar versus an area that was cleared out, that, would that have different signatures to distinguish the two scenarios? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. So here I, I will refer to the case of NGC 1068, where, um, I mean, uh, I, we actually uh, consider your uh, hypothesis, your suggestion now about a, a bar or another um, kinematic perturbation in the disk of the galaxy. But we have two arguments against that that I think they are very strong. One of them, as you can see here in, the, in NGC 1068 in the left panel, we draw, I mean, with these lines, the direction of the cone, of the ionization cone. So that is located, I mean, this is uh, silicon six, uh, iron two gas, so highly ionized gas, and it is located right inside um, the cavity. So it really looks like the outflow is pushing away the gas, uh, the molecular gas from the central region. And the other argument, which is shown here in the velocity map, which is shown in the middle, um, we draw this uh, ellipse uh, that uh, actually shows the center of the, of the ellipse, I mean, what we see in the molecular gas. And the AGN is not located at the center of this ellipse, but it's located in this point where the cone is starting. So you can see this ring of molecular gas in the left panel. There is like a small arm that we actually call the tongue in NGC 1068. And the AGN is located there. I don't know if you can see the black cross there. <laughs> uh, and that is the location of the AGN. So it's not the center of the ring. And that would be, like I said, those two arguments, the fact that is a lot of uh, ionized gas inside the cavity and that the center does not correspond, uh, the center of the ring does not correspond to the location of the AGN against the bar model. And that's why we interpret this as, as the gas that's being pushed away by the outflow. And there is one more piece of evidence, um, uh, which is in this uh, velocity map that you see here that is very complex. Um, but we have identified three kinematic components here. One of them would be the rotation of the disk. The other one is inflows along this structure that I call the tongue that looks like blue shifted material here. Um, this is gas that is coming directly towards the center. Uh, that has these velocities that look blue, but this component that is red shifted and not blue shifted here corresponds to an, a component we interpret as expansion in the disk. 
So with those three kinematic components, the, the rotational component, the inflow of gas, and the, the expanding disk, then we can reproduce this velocity map that looks very complex. So that's why I, I think that's the, the simplest interpretation for this case. And in other galaxies, it's similar. Um, but these cavities actually, they, I mean, among the galaxies that we have studied, we have observed only in three, four galaxies. But it's one of the examples that I believe um, are important to show to demonstrate the interaction of the outflow with the local ISM. Thank you. That's very impressive to have that level of details. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Giacomo? Yeah, thank you. Giacomo Venturi here. Uh, my question is a follow up on the Corona line question. Um, so I wanted to know uh, what do you think, so your opinion on, on their origin uh, uh, with respect to the presence of outflows. So if you think there is a causal connection between the presence of the two, so Corona lines and outflows, or if the, they are both there, uh, but uh, they're not causal, causally connected. So I explain myself better. So it could simply be that uh, um, you have uh, coronal lines uh, when you have uh, really energetic photons uh, from the AGN. So when the AGN is uh, really intense, the, the AGN emission is really intense, which also drives an outflow. Uh, and maybe in other cases, uh, since these lines are quite faint, uh, you may not observe them when the AGN is not uh, powerful enough, but you still see uh, the outflow in uh, the, the brightest lines, uh, let's say bracket gamma or whatever, uh, H alpha in the optical. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, if there could be a, a causal connection between the two uh, in the form of um, outflows, uh, uh, giving rise to these coronal lines through shocks. I don't know if this is possible energetically, uh, probably not, I don't know. Or due to the presence of uh, radio jets, uh, since in this, uh, some of these galaxies that you have shown, there are also uh, small scale radio jets. So radio jets that would uh, give uh, shocks and uh, give rise to uh, these coronal lines and at the same time uh, give the outflows. So in this case, uh, you would observe uh, the corona line emission only when there is the outflow. Uh, yeah, for this reason. Yeah, what's your opinion? Yes, yeah, thank you, Giacomo. Well, this is something we are investigating right now. Um, and um, I mean, it is a, a difficult question to answer because there are two things that, uh, there that are implied that, that we do not know in general. One of them is uh, what uh, is the um, physical mechanism that is driving these outflows. I mean, is it thermal winds? Is it the radiation pressure, magnetic field? I mean, we do not know that very well. And the other thing is we do not know also very well why some galaxies do not show corona. I mean, AGN, right? Why do not uh, why some of these AGN do not show corona lines and, and others show very strong corona lines? That is something that we also do not know. Um, very well. So right now we are uh, interpreting this an, as an empirical result saying, well, in silicon, if there is a silicon six or corona lines, these are always in an outflow. But like you are suggesting a causal connection or something, this is something we're investigating right now. And we don't know if there is, maybe I agree with you. It could be two things. One, maybe it's radiation pressure that these are very hard X-ray photons that ionize gas, and at the same time, they are able to somehow um, create these outflows in highly ionized gas, or the shocks uh, from the outflows or the radio jet, which can also contribute to the production um, of corona lines. So maybe it's not the, the ionization of the AGN that is uh, producing all the corona line emission that we see, but it's the outflow that uh, when it is propagating, it is enhancing the production of corona lines in other parts of the galaxies. Um, so yeah, th those are the, the two scenarios that we're considering right now, uh, but we are investigating that uh, right now. Okay, thank you. So and a really quick comment. Uh, I don't know much about corona lines, but uh, based on um, current studies, so what we know so far, 
uh, is there maybe a trend uh, of the presence uh, of Corona lines uh, with um, AGN power? So maybe you see them with more powerful AGN, you don't see them uh, with the less powerful AGN. Yes, that's something we would like to investigate with uh, all the galaxies in our sample when we have all the statistics. But um, some initial results, and I remember some previous studies, um, they have found some correlation between X-ray emission and the flux in the corona line. I don't remember. It, I think it was corona lines in the optical, so not the silicon six at that time. Um, but yeah, th th there have been some studies that suggest that. Uh, but we would like to do it with the whole sample. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great question. Um, Gabby? Yeah, thank you. And actually, I really like the way that uh, Giacomo sort of laid out all the different possibilities of the relation between the, the outflow and the corona lines. And actually, just to add to that, um, Thomas Bond, who's here in, uh, in the audience, he, he just published a paper where he, he actually speculated one more possibility, which is that the outflow is, um, I mean, you can see the corona lines more easily when there's outflows because it may be clearing out the obscuration that might be um, too, you know, because they're closer to the nucleus um, mm -hmm. than the narrow line region, then it may be that it's clearing the, the medium. So that's that's another possibility, but but it's true. I mean, it's very difficult to distinguish be between all the scenarios yes. that you gave and it's, and uh, I'm, I'm excited because I think uh, Francisco has the, the data that can actually tell us more about it. Um, so anyways, my question was also related to Corona lines and uh, just a point of clarification. So you mentioned that in the Kona survey, all of the galaxies uh, show silicon six, but that was one of your selection criteria, right? Um, well, yeah, thank you, Gabi, for this question. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, so I described that in, in the paper. Basically, at the beginning, yes, that was one of our selection criteria. So, you know, this um, project started uh, like probably other projects as well, especially with adaptive optics and terrafine spectroscopy, where you need um, a lot of time uh, at the telescope to observe these objects. So, we start with small samples and, and we were careful that they had corona lines. So for the first 20 galaxies, maybe that was one of our selection criteria. Uh, but then at some point, uh, and, and when we were at the telescope and we had uh, our, uh, you know, uh, plan A, plan B, plan C, et cetera, um, we observed other galaxies that we didn't know that they would have uh, corona lines, actually. So um, I think in, in the end, it was a surprise for us for I would say one fourth, so 10 out of 40, that we detected corona lines for the first time. Uh, and and we, we didn't know. I mean, there was nothing in the literature about that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Because um, I remember the first paper describes yes. the detection of silicon six as one of the, of the selection criteria. OK, so then my follow up question is, uh, what about in the MODA survey? What, what fraction are you finding? with uh, coronal lines? Uh, in the MODA survey? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, well, that's a small sample. As I mentioned, right now we have served the, the 10 confirmed dual AGN at redshift less than 0.05, uh, but that was like three, four years ago in 2018. <laughs> now probably there are more confirmed dual AGN. But anyway, that sample is only 10 galaxies and we have studied four and in the four galaxies, we have detected silicon six. Oh, really? So even in, in, in 60 to 40? In, in, no, so, okay, sorry. 60 to 40 is the only one among those four that we haven't detected silicon six. Sorry. So we have, yeah, we have analyzed in detail four, and NGC 60 to 40 does not have corona lines. That's true. Okay. Other three is Markarian 739, Markarian 463, and Markarian 266. Um, they have uh, silicon six. One, one of the nuclei. The other one, it's always that. I mean, I'm, among these three galaxies, one of them has silicon six, but the other nucleus does not have <laughs> silicon six. Yes. All right. Well, I look forward to figuring out why. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
very quickly hey. for Mar Marcarian 266. I, I, one of my students working on that right now, and, and we were looking at Silicon 6 yesterday. That's why <laughs> I, I have it in my mind. Um, it is uh, uh, so one of the two nuclei, one nucleus has this uh, emission line of Silicon 6, which is very strong in the central region, but it's just the, the central. Um, I mean, our solution is like 0.1 arc seconds, so it's like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 arc seconds. And there is nothing, uh, no silicon six outside that region. Um, that would be like a, a few hundred parts. I think it's 100 or 200 parts six in that galaxy. But it's really amazing how you move um, your cursor in the data cube and you see the spectrum, and then you see silicon six so strong at the nucleus, and then nothing, <laughs> nothing else in the field of view. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Gabby. Oh, so can I ask one question? So I didn't yes. want to, I have so many questions, but I will only ask one and then hopefully we'll keep chatting. Um, so, you know, with JWST, you're going to get incredible sensitivities and you will have access to a very large range of lines with varying ionization parameter. And I'm just thinking how amazing your data is going to be. Is there anything you want to say about your JWST program? Well, yeah, I, I mean, um, <laughs> I think um, JWST will revolutionize this field. I mean, basically, extragalactic astronomy in many aspects, uh, particularly for this kind of studies in the K band, um, near spec will provide um, sensitivities that, that we cannot get from the ground. So we'll be able to detect silicon six. Um, I think there will be more detections of silicon six in many more galaxies, I mean, AGN, um, especially because of two reasons. One of them is that in some galaxies, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the wretched of the galaxy, silicon six is the, at the position of the, um, um, uh, telluric absorption. Well, it's not, not telluric. Well, it's the atmospheric absorption. Sorry, um, at around two point, around two microns. So right now, that was one of, of the things that I was uh, discussing with Gabby right now. Some of our galaxies, uh, because of the redshift, it was not ideal for us to observe it from the ground because we said, okay, these emission lines, we we are not going to see them at all. I mean, they would be. Um, uh, buried in the atmospheric absorption. So, of course, that problem does not exist with JWST. Um, and, and the other problem is the opposite for some integral field spectrographs. They do not cover the region um, of silicon six or so around 1.97 microns, depending on the filter you are using. Um, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, silicon six is a, 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 an emission line that is difficult to observe. Uh, from the ground. Uh, so I think, yeah, that is going to be very easy with um, JWST. Um, and of course, uh, we will also observe due to the, the uh, uh, several filters in JWST, uh, other corona lines that uh, we cannot observe from the ground right now uh, with these instruments uh, that are located more in the L band, uh, I mean, at the uh, wavelengths larger than 2.4 microns, five microns, et cetera. So that will open uh, a completely new field for studies of corona lines uh, in AGN, um, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm excited to, to see what you find. Any more yes, questions? Yes, well, you, you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it'll be, I, I'm really excited. Um, any other questions? So if not, let's thank Francisco. And uh, thank you, everyone. anyone who wants to have a smaller group chat and hang on a little bit, uh, we can continue an informal discussion. I do have one other quick question, if I may. Uh, uh, so you know, there is renewed interest in uh, low ionization, broad absorption line, uh, AGN, as related to feedback. And uh, to me, it's not very clear yet uh, what, the, what the connection between the broad absorption line in quasars and, you know, these outflows that we're observing galaxy-wide. 
are. So my, my very quick question is whether any of your targets in either one of the samples shows any broad absorption lines. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Gabby. That's something we are investigating right now and something I, I didn't mention here. But uh, one of the things that I'm very interested uh, and also because of, of, of the things that you just mentioned is uh, what is the connection between those, um, well, uh, sometimes they call ultra fast outflows or, or uh, um, those outflows that are actually observed at small scales with these galaxy wide uh, or galaxy scale outflows. Uh, I'm very interested in that topic. So yes, we have a couple of galaxies in our sample that uh, have those kind of outflows. So uh, it's one of, of the things that um, one of my students is investigating. So one of them is NGC 3783. Um, I think uh, it would be very good to know what is the connection between these two different types of uh, outflows. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it's something that, uh, as I said, we're investigating right now. But I, I think um, it seems to me that the, um, the, the outflows creating this broad line AGN that we see like uh, in, in our line of sight, um, they usually are very fast outflows. And um, I think they are the precursors of the outflows that we see at larger scales that propagate uh, at larger distances. Um, but yes, that's, that's something that we are investigating right now. Great, thank you. Any other questions? So uh, can I ask just a few quick things? Yes, um, sure. Uh, so I was just, you know, thinking more about the future. And uh, since we had these ORCAS discussions, I don't know who all here was part of the ORCAS discussions. Um, you know, with your Kona survey, if you remember in those discussions, we, we could get less than a parsec scale spatial resolution. And so I wondered if, you know, you know, if you could do something with ORCAS, what would you do? And what do you think is the, the real breakthrough potential of that kind of spatial resolution? Yes. Well, I think um, one of the questions uh, we had uh, in the ORCAS collaboration was, is it going to be possible to um, use uh, ORCAS in the optical or, or in the near infrared? I don't remember what was the conclusion there, because right now, I think the, the problem was that we said we do not have an, an, an instrument in the optical uh, that could work with adaptive optics at Keck. Um, uh, well, the plan is uh, that it would be uh, part of the ORCAS um, mission that a optical IFU would be available and AO would become enabled in the optical. So just imagine the highest possible spatial resolution at 0.5 microns and uh and what would be okay yeah so <laughs> thank you uh, thank you for your answer that's uh, yeah because you know in the near infrared i mean with orcas of course we we probably will obtain better sensitivity a better cell ratio a better psf but the studies will be similar right to what we are doing right now i think in the near infrared um but in the optical where we can uh, really do um, very high special resolution, at least with the telescopes uh, we have right now, um, uh, something that hasn't been done before. Um, I think I would be very interested in the kinematics of um, O3. So that's one of the things that I would uh, uh, immediately <laughs> that I would like to study um, or the coronal lines, but. In the optical, uh, I'm not very much familiar with the, all the coronal lines in the optical. Um, so I will continue with this uh, investigation of the properties of the outflows where we can go to smaller scales and probably answer some of the questions that were asked. What is the, um, the shape of the origin of the outflow? Is it a, a sharp point or if it is like a um, truncated cone where you can actually see the, the collimation produced by the torus. So I think that's uh, one thing that we can do at those scales. 
So see if um, in, in these biconical models that we're using and in this field of biconical outflows, we can um, obtain better morphologies for the ionization cones in general. I mean, I'm calling ionization cones, but maybe they don't even look like cones anymore. I don't know. Um, but just look at the origin of the outflows, where they originate, and then we can tell um, more things about their, their properties, their impact on the galaxies, and as well, uh, something about the, the torus. Because you know, I mean, according to the unified model, we should have the torus uh, perpendicular, or, or the major axis of the torus should be perpendicular to the major axis of the bicone. Um, so if we can really, um, in, the, in the O3, if we can obtain detailed morphologies of the bicone, then maybe we can also say something about the structure of the torus, its orientation, its size, etc. So I think um, it would be very useful for studies of uh, properties and kinematics of the narrow line region in general, and that is connected to uh, the properties of the torus as well. Great, thank you. So that um, would be, yeah, that, that would be one thing. Um, yeah. And the other thing, um, so that's considering, I mean, this uh, topic that I talk about, uh, AGM feedback. Um, the other thing is that maybe we can look, uh, we can have an idea of the um, um, uh, kinematics of the broad line region. So probably we cannot resolve still the broad line region in many galaxies. Um, but um, like, like I was talking about Silicon 6 a few minutes ago, if we see in several pixels that there is uh, the broad line there, maybe we can tell more about the, um, the kinematics of the broad line region as well. So the shape of the emission line, I mean, not only the shape of the emission line, but maybe we can map different uh, in different pixels, the shape of the broad lines. And, and uh, that uh, can tell us more about, uh, I mean, the properties of the broad line ring, which is something that we don't know if there's only rotation or there are outflows. I think people also said there are inflows in the broad line region. So I think we can understand better uh, the properties of the broad line region as well. Great, I'm, I'm excited about that. And also talking more about, um, you know, the best targets and, and also really curious what you see with JWST and wondering if you're gonna find things like double peaks, uh, silicon six or something like that in some of your merger nuclei, that would be really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. If we can find like really close binaries or um yeah that, well that's another topic of course yeah uh, yeah so well yeah i i think um I, probably even the some of the discoveries that we have with you are things that we are not even considering right now or that we are not 100 uh, percent i mean we we have an idea we have science goals things that we want to do but hopefully the data will give us much more than what we expect right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think about it because we didn't have uh, the spectral resolution at, at the, you know, one to five microns with Spitzer. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have really high spectral mm -hmm. resolution and high sensitivity. And so I just can't wait to see what you, how many lines you detect and what the kinematics tells you. It'll be very interesting. Yes. So, so the same for your program. So you are uh, looking at the uh, low luminosity AGN. Uh, well, that is uh, one of the programs in which I'm a co-I, but the the mm -hmm. one that we are doing is um, looking for IMBHs and low mass galaxies. Okay. So yeah. So dwarf galaxies or. Yeah, dwarf galaxies and trying to find coronal lines in them and seeing if they're outflows and so a bunch of goals. But uh, I'm also very interested in all the questions about coronal lines and when you see them and when you don't and why, and whether it's a function of things like black hole mass, which uh, would, would affect you know, the hardness of the radiation field and therefore the, um, 
the ionization of these higher ionization potential lines. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I'm, I just wish that we could get more data with JWST, but it, <laughs> it's like yes. one object at a time and the statistical power isn't going to be there, but uh, I Yes, definitely. exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, because like yeah. I was saying, I mean, when, well, already um, observing at Keck or one of these telescopes, I mean, it's, it's difficult because you have to submit a proposal and, and it's very competitive. But then you go to, or, or you do it remotely, I mean, whatever, but you still have the weather. So obtaining these observations are difficult, but still we can do some statistical analysis, maybe small samples, but we can do um, something. With JWST, we will have, like you said, one object, two objects. And um, based on our experience, uh, I have objects that I know that they are difficult to observe from the ground and that I would like to observe them with JWST but they are not as famous or popular or, or yeah, I mean, um, like NGC 1068 or one of those famous galaxies. Um, so uh, those objects that I cannot observe from the ground, maybe because they, the emission lines are faint or like I was saying, the redshift is not ideal or things like that. Um, I'm finding difficult to propose for those objects <laughs> because yeah. propose for the most interesting, most famous, uh, Etc. I mean, fantastic objects, which is, um, I think, uh, how you should start, right? But yeah, yeah. Do actually, the objects that I cannot do from the ground, even if uh, right now I, I cannot tell many things about it, but it's part of the same problem. I cannot tell many things because I cannot observe them from the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? It looks like a lot of people stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think we're going to take off. I have a group meeting with my group, but uh, yeah. thank you so much. We want to go to yeah, the same for me. I mean, I, I have until well, here's one p.m. Uh, Central Time. So show it up for you. I think it's two p.m. Right? Uh, now it's one forty. Yeah, it's one forty. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's still fun talking to everybody. I really enjoyed. Join your talk, Francisco. Thank you. And I can't wait to hear more about your results. So keep us posted. <laughs>